Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today uh, on fair treatment, workers' rights, and diversity and inclusion. My name is Navina, and I'm representing the Sustainable Investment Platform, which is a platform uh, in collaboration with Capital Markets Malaysia and the Institutional Investors Council of Malaysia. Today's webinar will take about an hour, 15 minutes, and we have two esteemed guest speakers that I'm very much looking forward to introducing to you. But first of all, just to, to uh, let you know that we have two presentations, each speaker will present, and this will be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, as you will see that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So you can just type your question uh, in there. And once they are done with their presentation, they will take questions uh, from the box. So um, this session is being recorded and we will provide uh, the slides for the presentations um, in a couple of days after the event. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker from the PRI, Remy Fernandez, who is a specialist in human rights and social is issues to uh, kick off the session by delivering his presentation. Remy, over to you. Great, thank you, Navina. Um, and I'll just share my screen as well so we can get the slides up for the presentation. Perfect. Um, can you see these slides well on your end? Yes, I can see that. Fantastic. So yes, um, thank you very much for having me on this webinar. Um, I'm delighted to uh, join and speak to such an important topic that is gaining increasing momentum with institutional investors globally. So just by means of introduction, um, as mentioned by Davina, my name is Remy Fernandez. Um, I'm a specialist in human rights and social issues here at the PRI, um, and I lead on the PRI's Decent Work Program, um, which we will soon be publishing our thought le leadership paper on, um, formalizing our support of the Decent Work Agenda. So today I'll be covering several areas. So just starting off by the broader uh, PRI human rights and social issues work, um, focusing on decent work and also the minimum safeguard expectations, uh, which are the minimum standards of work, uh, which can be used to drive positive outcomes in line with SDG 8, uh, which is decent work and economic growth. I'll then focus more broadly on how investors can address social issues across investment framed through human rights due diligence, and also, and then finally conclude by focusing on migrant work and forced labor uh, in supply chain. So informed by the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, we have clarified that institutional investors have a three-part responsibility to respect human rights. So this involves, as you can see here on the slide, a policy commitment, due diligence processes, as well as enabling or providing access to remedy. So to effectively implement the due diligence and access to remedy requirements, investors can use three different levers. So this is investment decisions, that is investors could consider human rights issues when determining how to allocate capital. Um, and so well-run companies that manage human rights issues well, find it easier to access financing or even experience a reduction in their cost of capital, as well as stewardship. So this is investors addressing human rights uh, through their dialogues with investees, as well as engagement on public policy. So to understand their exposure and the actions required, investors need to request information from and throughout the value chain. So from their investment managers, other service providers, and or investees. And investors need to set expectations and influence others. So to know, act on, and show how they manage harm to people arising from their business activities and relationships. So this is an important step in clarifying responsibility, as well as identifying and prioritizing issues linked to forced labor across supply chain. So since the adoption of the UN guiding principles and business and human rights on business and human rights and OECD guidelines for multinational enterprise of 2011, we have seen an uptake and convergence in human rights norms by a range of stakeholders. So to name a few, uh, the Modern Slavery Acts in Australia, California, and the UK, the Dutch Child Labor Due Diligence Act, 
the French duty of vigilance law and the EU wide due diligence regime for human rights and environmental issues, which is currently under consideration and a proposal. Looking at the investment industry, the UNGPs have been used by investors in engagements with companies, but also inform their responsible investment approaches more broadly. For PRI signatories, however, this has been a voluntary exercise, and we've only seen a minority of leading investors participate or report on human rights. So just to sort of provide a snapshot on this, about 22% of PRI asset owner and 17% of investment managers signatories mentioned human rights in reporting. And so it's, it's also good to see that there has been growth um, across the different years, across the years of reporting, and that this percentage is increasing over time. In terms of collaborative engagements run by the PRI, the number is 115 investors over the past five years. So it's in terms of AUM, it is a significant amount. Um, however, this does re represent less than 5% of investor signatories. So as you can see here on the slide, uh, the PRI's human rights position paper builds on the UNGPs and statements made by the OECD and the UN to make it clear to institutional investors that they are expected to res uh, respect human rights across all their investments. These expectations have been driven not only by growing visibility and urgency around many human rights issues, but also by a better understanding of the investor's role in shaping real world outcomes and of their responsibility to do so. And this is across all their investment activities. I think it's, it also is important to reinforce this, and this is something I'll touch on um, through the rest of the presentation, but it's important to reinforce uh, robust human rights due diligence. So this serves to identify and address the most salient human rights risks. In doing so, investors can prioritize, um, prioritize issues based on the scope and severity, as well as prioritizing the most salient labor issues facing workers across supply chain. So moving a little bit more and narrowing down our scope towards decent work um, and labor issues. So this slide here represents some of the most pertinent decent work issues facing workers pre-COVID. It's important to consider the challenges of many of the decent work deficits listed on this slide. And these have largely been exacerbated by COVID-19. The examples you see here highlight the severity of decent work challenges pre-COVID. These examples overlap and can exacerbate each other. So for instance, workers in the informal economy are more likely to be subject to greater variations in working time, more at risk of working poverty, more exposed to risks of modern slavery amongst other factors. So COVID-19 has highlighted many of the vulnerabilities across multiple segments of the labor market. Uh, and it has exposed, for instance, platform workers whose contingent worker status did not afford them social protections and simultaneously highlighted many of the vulnerabilities in existing social protections for essential workers, viewed by many as low skilled workers. So as you can see here, the definition uh, we have used for decent work that we have used in the PRI position paper stems from the ILO and is closely linked with SDG 8, in which during the UN General Assembly in September 2015, decent work and the four pillars became integral elements of the new 2030 agenda for sustainable development. What is important to highlight here is the focus on affording workers safeguards, such as fair income, social protection, freedom of association, and equality of opportunity and treatment. And so what's important to know from this is it's sort of a shift away from framing workers as human capital, reducing them to mere economic assets. So this slide here highlights the safeguard expectations, which are the baseline to driving positive worker outcomes in line with SDG 8. So through the lens of investment and through the lens of, we have sort of the decent work lens of the PRI, we view these as sort of the minimum standards um, that investors need to address to then drive positive sustainability outcomes. So these minimum safeguards are interconnected and feed into each other. 
For instance, a living wage is both collectively bargained and acts as a driver for reducing wage inequality and better physical and mental health outcomes. And so addressing this within supply chain can help reduce financial dependencies between workers, employees, employers, and third party agents. And so this concurrently reduces the risk of exploitation of migrant workers. And also, if a family is earning a living wage and is covered by social protection, it is less likely that their children will end up in situations of forced labor. So the ILO has outlined uh, the key transitions in the Centenary of Work paper, which represent three key drivers of change. As you can see here in this slide, this includes the transition to a low carbon economy. And so it's important that investors take a just transition lens towards their net zero commitments. And so this is to ensure that the inequality crisis is treated in tangent with the climate crisis. Looking across the renewable energy value chain, it's critical that workers in industries such as mining and extractives are not put at greater risk through greater demand for battery min minerals, such as lithium and cobalt. Coming towards the tech advances lens, tech advances will have significant impacts across multiple sectors and supply chain. So broadly speaking, the largest impacts will be seen in terms of the automation of work, calling for reskilling and transition planning um, and through risks associated with platform work. And then finally, looking at demographic changes, so shifting demographics and migration patterns call for a lifespan approach to be taken towards tackling decent work issues. And so this involves supporting a growing youth transition into work, continuous uh, education, reskilling and adaptation to the key transitions and rapid technological change, as well as supporting skills shortages from a growing aging population exiting the workforce through um, and this can be supported through migration, um, technology, and supporting uh, elderly workers through reimagining the care economy. So it's important for investors to consider how migration will shift over time and where emergent needs are for migrant workers. This can help preempt emergent human rights risks and help investors actively seek to shape and address them. And so the lifespan approach can help frame how we address issues in the other two key transitions um, and ensure that we capture the entire scope of workers. So from those just entering the workforce or workers sort of in that transition period to workers exiting the workforce and everything in between. So I'd like to move on to now addressing how investors can address social issues and human rights more broadly across their investments. Um, pulling from best practice and leading work, and then from there diving more into putting the spotlight on migrant work and forced labour in supply chain. So it's important to address social issues from a human rights perspective to ensure that all issues are identified and addressed. Part of this includes setting a robust policy commitment that is in line with internationally recognised human rights. As you can see on this slide here, uh, this slide outlines the level of embeddedness this policy should have across both internal governance mechanisms and processes, um, operations, and across investment decisions and stewardship activities. And so this, the importance of framing and addressing social issues from a human rights perspective means that investors can identify uh, certain social issues that might not have identified through merely just focusing on a few different topical areas. So it can bring up issues that might not have come up um, through other means. So it's important to have sort of a robust process in which to identify them. So as I've highlighted sort of across the presentation, it's essential for investors to have a robust human rights due diligence process. And so this ensures that investors are able to identify and address the most salient human rights issues across their investment portfolio. So once, once this has been identified, it is important for investors to prevent the identified negative outcomes and continue monitoring human rights outcomes. And severity and leverage are commonly used to guide investors on how to sequence and focus their activities. So determining where the most appropriate actions are to take. 
Severity can help prioritize which issues to deal with first based on the scale of the outcome, as well as the scope. So that refers to how many individuals affected, as well as the irremediable character of the human rights risk. Leverage, on the other hand, and this is sort of referring back to what I was speaking to earlier, refers to the capacity to exert influence over investees and other stakeholders to exert change. So the section on the right-hand side of this slide uh, refers to, outlines the key areas of leverage available uh, to investors, which include investment decisions, um, uh, which in could include uh, for an equity investor in exerting influence through proxy rights and voting, and voting rights, stewardship of investees, um, engagement with policymakers and other key stakeholders. So the chart I want to sort of show you here uh, outlines how investors can seek to engage with investees on human rights to prevent and uh, mitigate as well as enable remedy. So what's important to highlight from this slide is that investors can build their leverage through collaboration with other investors. And this is a really important step is sort of identifying where leverage can be built and what other investors to engage with and which would be the most sort of powerful investors in terms of what their focus area is and where they can best exert leverage to have the biggest amount of impact. I also want to stress um, that the severity of the negative human rights outcomes and human rights consequences of divesting should always be considered first. So this is sort of divestment being sort of a last step solution in exerting leverage and seeking to address human rights. So I want to conclude this presentation by bringing the spotlight onto migrant work and forced labor in the supply chain. So the statistics here represent the overall picture of migrant work. And as you can see, it has a staggering 40 million workers in conditions of modern slavery. The text on the right represents the factors driving migration, such as unstable conditions in a migrant worker's home country, exposure to key risk sectors and barriers to gaining formalized and legitimized employment. Um, and these risks are further elevated through corruption and control me mechanisms across the migrant worker chain. And so the slide here outlines how these risks are found across the migrant worker journey. I want to highlight how addressing the decent work safeguard expectations can mitigate many of these risks across the migrant worker journey. So addressing the decent work safeguards can afford migrant workers economic dignity and provide them with greater agency. So for instance, a living wage can minimize the risk of migrant workers being in situations of debt bondage um, and in areas where there may be high prevalence of forced labor in the informal economy, investors can seek to engage with sovereigns. So what investors are looking out for to address these issues? So the short answer is the implementation of the UNGPs. So sort of starting from the beginning of this process here and coming towards the end of the implementation process. So governance of human rights. So this involves having human rights policies in place reflecting senior management buy-in and oversight, um, how the policy is embedded throughout the organization. So who has ultimate responsibility for labor and human rights within the company and supply chains. And there needs to also be clear links between ethical sourcing and buying teams. So particularly the alignment of incentives to reduce the risk of negative human rights outcomes across supply chains. And so this is particularly important in looking at sort of lead times and understanding what each team and what are the governance structures in each team to minimize risks across both. In terms of recruitment practices, so especially when migrant workers are involved, migrants and refugees are at increased risk of exploitation as they tend to lack access to legal employment contracts and social security. And this is where looking at the safeguard expectations, particularly in terms of social protection and access to benefits, and really reinforcing that across portfolio companies um, can help sort of mitigate these issues here. 
In terms of company management and potential and um, actual human rights risks, it's important to engage in supply chain mapping. So this uh, means having visibility beyond first tier of suppliers and really going down the supply chain to understand who are the key actors involved and who are the stakeholders involved at each sort of tier of supply chain. So companies need to better map this information, uh, map their supply chains, and also share this information with investors. In terms of relationships with suppliers, um, it's important to encourage long-term relationships. Um, this is to avoid last minute changes in orders and contracts and increasingly shorter lead times. So this is increasingly, this is known to increase significantly the risk of forced or child labor, as well as increase overtime and longer working hours. And so it's important to encourage consolidated supply chains, which can help with vis visibility and reduce exposure to labor abuses. Um, also, it's important to encourage better and standardized disclosure on labor practices and supply chains and a better approach to auditing. So companies that show serious commitment and greater maturity to tackling human rights risks are increasingly moving away from uh, auditing to establish a local presence that can work with and monitor progress with worker-led initiatives, local stakeholders such as trade unions, NGOs, and civil society organizations. Which leads me to the third point, um, which is that better engagement with NGOs uh, or working unions and community organizations is important. And this is really important in terms of triangulating auditing processes and ensuring that the information that is provided and communicated is accurate. And so something else to sort of reinforce is that a lack of worker voice um, across the supply chain is a key industry, uh, industry risk. Um, freedom association and collective bargaining can enable workers to better negotiate wages and working conditions. Um, and with community organizations and NGOs, uh, unions can provide information from the ground up to allow investors to collaborate uh, with suppliers and, commun and with community reporting. And so finally, moving to monitoring and corrective action. So according to the United Nations Guiding Principles, uh, businesses not only have a responsibility to avoid infringing on the human rights of others, but should also remediate any adverse human rights impacts they have caused or contributed to. So companies should be more transparent about the effectiveness of their grievance mechanisms and their remediation actions. So this is to ensure that workers in supply chains know of these mechanisms and also make use of them. So I hope this provides sort of um, a sort of overview of how investors can tackle social issues um, across supply chain, particularly focusing on um, false labor and migrant work. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides now and move on to any questions that the audience might have. Thanks very much for that, uh, Remy. I don't see any questions in the question box, but maybe we'll give it um, a minute or two and see if there are any. Okay, perhaps we might get some questions later, but um, perhaps I can then introduce our next speaker. Thanks again, Remy, for that presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome now Jodi Mitra from the International Labour Organization. Jodi is a technical officer based in Malaysia and is currently working on a project on advancing workers' rights in the palm oil sector. Uh, Jodi, over to you and uh, my colleague will be sharing your slides. Thank you very much, Navina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope my audio is all right. Um, so thanks to CMM for inviting me to speak uh, in this webinar. Um, my, my name is Jodan Mitra, like what Navina said, and I'm, I'm working as technical officer for ILO. I'm currently based in Malaysia. Actually, I've been here uh, for over five years now. Uh, before this, I worked in uh, Myanmar and Philippines also with ILO uh, on issues of forced labor and child labor. Um, before my current project, uh, which is um, 
Uh, now it's on advancing workers' rights in the palm oil sector in Indonesia and Malaysia. Before this, I was part of the global project uh, promoting ratification and uh, the application of the Isle of Force Labor Protocol, which Malaysia actually uh, ratified um, this March. Uh, and we can move to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, next one, please. So I'd like to begin with just a very brief introduction about our organization. But I think that um, all you know um, of you would probably know already about ILO. It's a specialized agency of the United Nations um, with a specific mandate of promoting decent work for all. And it's the only tripartite UN agency um, with the government, the workers, the employers, uh, representatives as part of our uh, governing body. And also, you know, this tripartite structure actually um, is very essential um, to promote, you know, um, open debates and elaborate uh, labor standards and policies. So currently, we have uh, 187 uh, member states. Um, and then you probably heard about ILO conventions, uh, protocols, and recommendations. So these are the ILO standards that are developed through this tripartite uh, structure. And there's also uh, other policies and uh, programs um, that uh, we implement, like this uh, project that, that I'm handling, um, which also aims to promote decent work uh, for all women and, and men. And um, in the next slide, I'd like to quick uh, to you know give you just a quick overview about some of the key labor issues in Malaysia. Um, the next slide, yeah. So um, Malaysia is a country with huge economic potential, and the government has laid a national development plan uh, for Malaysia to become a high income uh, and high tech nation with better quality of life by 2025. So a lot of factors, um, including the effects of the pandemic. Um, Pose serious threats to you know the the advances that the country has done, and um and one of this is also you know the the issue about um uh, lack of uh, workers in some of the sectors. So for instance, um Reuters reported just in June that uh, Malaysia lacks at least uh, 1.2 million workers across uh, manufacturing, plantation, and construction. And among the locals, uh, there's also this mismatch in unavailable skills or also work expectations uh, with the jobs that are available in the labor market. So these industries um, have also relied on migrant workers to fill in jobs in the sectors in the past. And in here, I'd like to pause and just you know, emphasize how migrant workers have really contributed to the Malaysian economy in, in such ways. And in Remy's presentation earlier, um, he also mentioned how migration could be part of the solution of you know, the demographic shifts that could actually affect the future of the, um, the labor market and the Malaysian economy in general. So there's a lot of rethinking as to how you know, we deal with uh, labor migration governance in the country. Various uh, laws in Malaysia related to labor and employment have been amended over the past months. Um, however, there's there's this need to you know raise awareness about the legal amendments and also provide employers with clear guidelines related to this. So there's a lot of socializing that needs to be done to this also uh, are um, they, they reach even the small and medium uh, enterprises, even the micro uh, enterprises. And uh, particularly for this um, small, medium um, and micro enterprises, they also need assistance uh, from the government to address some of the business and labor challenges that they are facing. And in the next slide, um, so I'd like to focus us a bit more on the, the labor the issues uh, faced by the migrant workers. So we in the ILO, we do not have the official statistics for migrant workers in the country. However, according to the Department of Statistics in Malaysia, uh, international migrants from abroad uh, to Malaysia was 10.4% uh, um, of the population in 2020. And there are public reports on labor abuses uh, in some companies um, relating to exorbitant recruitment fees and um, unfair labor practices, passport retention, non-payment of wages, uh, excessive overtime, uh, non-conducive living conditions, and, and other indicators of forced labor. Um, some sectors like um, plantation, manufacturing, construction services, domestic work, 
are among those that have been highlighted in the media and where cases of labor exploitation have been reported. Um, particularly for the undocumented migrant workers, they're limited in terms of access to legal remedies to claim the rights uh, as workers. And um, this hinders also reforms um, to end exploitation of workers in general when, they, when the undocumented migrant workers aren't able to access legal remedies. Um, and somehow this also relates to you know, having limited uh, pathways for regular migration. And an ILO study um, that was conducted in um, December 2020, was published in December 2020, showed also that there's um, a negative um, public attitudes towards migrant workers in Malaysia. And um, this negative attitudes um, are expressed through discriminatory actions, such as limiting or denying entry, uh, exclusion from access um, to services, uh, public support for laws that enshrine social exclusion to migrant workers and denying um, equal wages and uh, par with nationals. So this is unfortunate because there is this lack of appreciation of the positive contribution of migrant workers to Malaysia's uh, development socially and economically. And um, in fact, in 2015, uh, the World Bank um, uh, has a data from Malaysia suggesting that a 10% uh, net increase in manual or low-skilled migrant workers may increase Malaysia's GDP by up to 1.1%. Um, and the other issue that uh, we've seen is the um, low um, unionization among migrant workers uh, or workers in general. And we know the trade unions are very important in terms of workers' protection. Um, however, um, data from the Malaysian Tr Department of Trade Union Affairs um, uh, show that there's only 6% of um, are, 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 are unionized in the country, uh, although this data is from several years ago in 2016 or 2017, but uh, this, the low level of unionization is still true. And um, the other issue is, you know, child labor, uh, which have been reported in certain pockets of the country, such as in plantations and in service sector. And in the next slide, um, here I'd like to just discuss the key legislation and policy considerations. Um, positive note, on a positive note, the country has made significant commitments and progress uh, to address some of these issues, uh, such as through the national uh, law reform. And also uh, ratification of the ILO Forced Labor Protocol uh, just this March, like what I mentioned uh, in my introduction, and the development of the National Action Plan on Forced Labor. These are very important um, frameworks that could actually guide the national efforts to address forced labor and related issues that affect them. So even the labor migration issues that you know, factor in the um, uh, feedback from the, the employers addressing the challenges that employers also face um, are, have already have been considered in developing this National Action Plan on Forced Labor. So this, this are good um, roadmap in a way, you know, uh, that could really have an impact in, in the, um, having solutions for forced labor in the country. And as investors, um, you may also want to actually advocate for the implementation of these commitments. It is the implementation of this action plan, the provisions of the ILO Forced Labor Protocol, as well as uh, enforcement of national laws uh, with a view to protect all workers uh, that could determine measurable impacts to improving the working conditions of the workers, particularly the vulnerable groups such as migrants. And we move to the next slide. So, there are hundreds of ILO conventions, uh, protocols, and recommendations that you know, cover all aspects of world of work. Uh, but you have probably seen um, more often in trade agreements, investment treaties, national laws, company policies, a provision to adhere or respect what is called the core standards of the ILO or the fundamental principles in the rights at work. So as investors, I think you're interested to learn more about this. And so I focus my next slides on introducing definitions of these principles, but also um, providing some examples of what are the good practices to promote um, these principles. 
So as part of your due diligence, um, you could examine, for example, how companies are respecting these principles or how they are preventing, assessing, monitoring, and mitigating the risks of labor violations, uh, not just in paper, but in practice. And here um, I start with, uh, here you will see the, the different um, fundamental principles and rights at work, freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining, the elimination of all forms of forced or compulsory labor, the effective abolition of child labor, the elimination of discrimination in respect to employment and occupation and safe and healthy working environment. So these fundamental principles and rights at work um, are a set of uh, principles that all members of the ILO, even if they have not ratified um, the conventions that um, relate to this, they have an obligation by virtue of being ILO member states uh, to respect, promote, and to realize these principles. So these are that's why it's very important to understand what these are. And in the next slide, uh, I'd like to also mention that um, this MNE declaration or the tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises in social policy is uh, the main document um, for ILO that was also developed, you know, um, a, with inputs from different stakeholders, especially from the tripartite constituents and referring to um, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, UN Guiding Principles, um, on business and human rights, OECD guidelines for MNE, and th this cover and provide um, specific guidelines for the the companies um, on the issues that relate to to labor, uh, including you know the the fundamental principles and rights at work that are in red, but also uh, those that are um, like for example on social security, employment promotion. Um, a training conditions of work and life wages benefits um and industry industrial relations um access to remedy and examination of grievances and in the next slide um next slide please so with the reference to those fundamental principles and rights at work these are the core labor conventions that um that are in in the ILO, and you will see here there's eight. Um, uh, the the Malaysian government has ratified um six out of eight. Um, one has been denounced, which the C one o five or the abolition of forced labor convention. Um, but you know it's our hope that in the future this will also be re ratified. But uh, Malaysia has ratified the forced labor convention twenty nine. Uh, this is what the forced labor protocol that they recently ratified actually um supplements and um yeah the worst forms of child labor convention minimum age convention on child labor so we move to the next slide um let's go one by one to uh, on this you know um relevant principles and uh, let me just check my time um we have the first freedom of association the right to collective bargaining and um, in terms of definition, um, the freedom of association means it's the right of all employers and all workers. So it's not just the, the workers that have the, the right to associate, but also the employers um, to also to freely and voluntarily establish and join groups uh, for the promotion and defense of their occupational interests. And in the next slide, um, we share some of the what could be done to promote this. Um, so first, there's the need to respect the right of all workers to be part of the union of their choice without you know, any fear of intimidation or reprisal. And this, of course, has to be in accordance with uh, the national law. Um, also, um, you know, companies uh, can, can put um, policies that really uh, support the trade union activities as well. Uh, for example, even providing um, facilities that that like for meetings um, um, or or notice boards where the trade unions can also um, give some announcements to their members, uh, as well as even in some some companies they also have like an office for the trade union there. Then the um, non-discriminatory policies and procedures um, for if you're a trade union member. Um, 
let's say you're you're not discriminated against you know um a possible promotion or or um you're not the first to go when when there's you know dismissal or transfer so um in in areas you know uh such as employment and decisions on advancement dismissal or transfer and um also uh having recognizing the representatives of these organizations uh, for purpose of collective bargaining uh, collective bargaining being also voluntary process, but this is very helpful in terms of, you know, creating a harmonious industrial relations, uh, because then you have a venue to discuss um, um, what concerns the workers and also the employers and, and find, you know, um, agreements um, that would benefit uh, both parties. Um, and and then there's, there are, this, this is a way to also avoid, you know, like those um, complaints that, um, that are sometimes uh, not addressed internally, and with this, of course, you, there, there's that commitment to follow through with with the agreements and the collective um, bargaining process, and um, having you know uh, meaningful discussions as to how these are implemented as well. Um, having um, addressing also any problems solving or needs of uh, interest uh, to workers and management, including issues such as restructuring and training, uh, redundancy procedures, safety and health issues, um, grievance procedures, and so forth. And one thing that um, as investors might be uh, interested to also look at is, you know, them having the ensuring that the the trade unions uh, are not, there's no interference. Um, and in the in ILO, we define interference as any act uh, designed to promote the establishment of workers' organizations under the control of employers or employers' organization. So that's that's very important that they're independent and uh, they uh, genuinely um, represent the workers. And in the next slide, let's go to, I think this is, so this is forced labor. Uh, and here you see the definition of forced labor, uh, which is from the ILO Forced Labor Convention 29. Um, it's all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily, himself or herself voluntarily. And if you look at the definition, you will see that uh, there are two key elements that needs to be there before you say that this is forced labor. Uh, first, there's the involuntariness, you know, um, and then there's the menace or threat of penalty. So in this case, that forced labor is not like any, um, like substandard working condition. Substandard working condition could be one um, labor violation, for instance, uh, non-payment of wages. So that's a, you know, a labor violation that has to be acted upon, of course. But then it's not necessarily forced labor. If there is no other, you know, there, there's no other indicators that would suggest that um, there's there's uh, involuntariness there or there's uh, many sub penalties. So you have to look at multiple indicators before you say that there's forced labor. And when we move to the next slide, here you will see the different indicators of forced labor. So there's 11. And the purpose of this indicator is really to serve as alerts or signs um, that uh, there's the possibility of forced labor. So if let's say if it's just one indicator that you found, you you would um, the the uh, whoever is doing the monitoring or let's say it's the labor inspector uh, or your HR um, uh, would like to actually uh, look if there are, uh, there's also the presence of the other indicators so that you can determine if there's in fact you know a forced labor um, uh, meeting the definition that we earlier discussed and here you will see that you know there's the physical or sexual violence but this alone, um, even if it's just one indicator, uh, this could be enough to say that there is forced labor because no one will subject will want to subject themselves to physical or sexual violence. And in that case, you know, um, the the uh, penalty is also this violence in itself. Um, then the deception could come in various forms. For instance, let's the, um, the promise for, uh, to the worker when he or she was recruited uh, was actually not what he or she received when she when the person is already in employment so there could be like contract substitution as well that happened or 
it could also be that um, during employment, so there's the this person was recruited um, freely, you know, uh, there, there was a really good um, recruitment procedure. But then during the employment, um, there were sudden changes to the, um, the conditions of work. And then the, the person was not uh, consulted if um, he or she agrees to these changes. So there's no consent in that sense. There's involuntariness there. Um, and then um, the penalty, let's say the, the, there's another indicator about, you know, that um, this person, um, this person's wages uh, will not be given to, to him or her. So, so then you meet uh, both definitions of forced labor. And then there are other um, indicators such as abuse of vulnerability. Um, vulnerability factors could, be, could uh, mean different things for different workers. So it's important to understand um, uh this you know like in your company what could potentially be used to coerce the the victim uh i mean the the worker for for instance in some cases it's the language um <clears throat> issue they they don't understand um the contract that they signed or let's say their lack of um a support system uh, in Malaysia, and, and this could be manipulated to to make the the worker, you know, um, a dependent to the employer for for their needs. Um, so so the, it's it's a um, wide range of vulnerability factor that you can look at here. It could be the work permit um, being tied to the employer, and the, the the employer could say that oh, I won't. Um, renew your work permit if you don't you know um follow the orders um yeah and so for that bandage here this is related to uh exorbitant recruitment fees um in many cases uh but also at the same time this is you know when um there's there's the money that's lent to the worker um for uh high interest that it's impossible for the worker to repay it uh, within a reasonable amount of time so it's systematic um uh, ballooning of, of the the interest or let's say there's no clear um documentation as to how payment will be made and for how long uh there's there's that manipulation in some ways and then the restriction of movement wherein there, there could be you know the lacking up um of the worker in, in facilities or uh, surveillance um, cameras that, that really um, impede their, their freedom of movement, even if it's outside already working hours. Um, the restriction of, I mean, this is the um, uh, withholding of identity documents, uh, passport retention, for instance, um, that, that really is also, um, has been reportedly common in, in some of them um, among migrant workers. Um, and, and when the, this, the passport has to be kept by the worker, um, and if this is, you know, this is taken by their employer um, by force, then that's considered as an indicator of, of um, forced labor. So in some instance, when the employer needs to get the passport for administrative purposes, let's say they want to renew um, the work permit, or the visa, then um, they can do so, but very short period of time, and then the passport has to be returned to the to the worker, um, or they can also have like a photocopy if that that would be sufficient. Um, but but really, the um, the passport has is the property of the worker, and um, they should consent when when uh, they give it to the employer only on for certain um, necessary requirements that has to be you know undertaken. Um, the good practice that we've seen is that um, in the compliance to Act 446, uh, they, some of the companies um, would have like uh, accommodations that have the um, uh, cupboards or cabinets uh, that are secured and then where workers can put their passports. They, you don't need a locker that is um, like separate where workers need to ask permission from from the security guard or from the management to get it. So it's not like on demand. And then in, in the, um, then it's already against that, you know, that principle that um the workers' uh passports are their property and and, and the issue about isolation, which is also related to restriction of movement, uh, intimidation of uh, or threats uh, directly to the worker, or it could also be to their, you know, like their family members. Or in some cases, um, this intimidation or threat could be indirect. For instance, um, if the um, 
uh, like a sample, an example is made uh, with the other workers. Let's say there's the physical abuse of the other workers to show the others that if you um, leave or, or try to leave your job, then this will happen to you. So that's another indicator. And then the abusive working or living conditions, which also relate to, you know, like um, occupational safety and health uh, issues that, that go with like threat if they, they don't uh, um, do the tasks that are considered um, hazardous, uh, they, will, they will, let's say, um, lose their jobs. Or um, the um, abusive living condition would relate to uh, violations to, of Act 446 as well. And then withholding of wages, which could, um, it's it's very systematic, um, wherein the, the purpose is really to keep the, the worker for much longer time than needed. Uh, this is not the same as with an non-payment of wages. If it's just, you know, one time, let's say there's some delays in payment of wages. So this is not uh, considered like withholding of wages. But if it becomes like the regular so it's it's already systematic, and the purpose is really to um, to keep the worker for much longer. Then then that's an indicator of forced labor, and excessive overtime um, would also uh, need to consider the um, the national laws um, on on working hours and um, and overtime. And uh, if this is excessive to uh, you know it exceeds the national limit, then um, that could be considered as an indicator of forced labor. Or let's say um, the the worker has to work overtime just to meet the the um, uh, minimum wage. So this, according to the ILO uh, Committee of Experts, that uh, could also be considered as an indicator. And uh, let's move on. Um, okay. So these are just some of the things that you can do to address, um, uh, you know, the the potential risks of forced labor. So on pre-employment, um, assessing and monitoring your recruitment agencies, having um, clear, transparent contracts uh, a, in the language of the worker. Um, also, you know, not charging or imposing fees to the worker, um, being clear with the hiring criteria um, for the worker, um, providing them with, uh, with the necessary training, um, handbooks, also ensuring the documentation of the worker because this is the responsibility of the employer. Um, having good grievance um, and dispute resolution mechanisms. And in the next slide, oh, sorry, next slide, yeah. For during employment, uh, making sure also that the principles and guidelines on labor protection apply to all workers, to so both migrants and locals. And um, there's, you know, the respect of freedom of association that we mentioned earlier, uh, that wage payments are in compliance with, you know, with the uh, national laws, same for occupational safety and health. Um, wage deductions um, and in kind payments like Employment Act would have some relevant provisions that you need to to look into this. In that you know that if there's um, there's the practice of giving pay slips, um, uh, making sure that you know there's there's no wage deductions there that are non legally compliant, and um, the payments and kinds um, a, in any form, for example, goods or services, accommodations um, shall not be used as payment of wages. Um, Workers shall not be compelled to purchase goods or services also from the, the store um, that's required by the, the company. And now we've spoken about the loans and advance to payments that has to be documented and you know um, clearly accepted by both parties. And in the next slide. So deposits from workers, this could also be an issue that could relate to an you know, uh, indicator of forced labor. So it's important to have like just reasonable amount uh, that must, you know, um, it not deter or stop the workers from leaving. So the worker should be informed of the conditions um, for return of the deposit, including the uniform to be returned in reasonable condition. So in terms of the working hours, rest days, holidays, and leave um, must be compliant with the national law. For freedom of movement, um, there's movement restrictions like during COVID that ha that um, were imposed. So if, if this is aligned with the government policies, then that's fine. But you know, during those times, there then the workers should have access to telephones or internet that would enable them to contact people from outside. Um, but if there's no uh, restrictions from the government, then there's there's um, there should be like complete freedom of movement. Um, then. Keeping, making sure that there's always this dialogue with the workers and workers' representatives is a good practice. And in the next slide, um, 
yeah, so compliance with Act 446 or the Minimum Housing Standards and um, Amenities Act, uh, OSH Act, and other COVID-19 related prevention policies, um, compliance with Passport Act in terms of you know none withholding of the passport of the workers, um, having well, it's a good practice to have on-site migrant workers coordinator as well. So it's easier to communicate your policies and also to get feedback from them. Uh, they could also be you know. Um, uh, like a like coordinator for some activities that you you want for migrant workers. And in terms of disciplinary and grievance me measures, um, having strict policy uh, to prevent um, violence, harassment, abuse, and coercion, and um, having a formal complaints mechanism that allows anonymous reporting um, and protects whistleblower. whistleblowers is very important as well. Uh, next slide. So post-employment, in terms of termination of employment, um, they, it should be in compliance with, again, with the national law, uh, payment of final wages. Um, the, the worker should be pay, should receive you know, all outstanding remuneration. Um, and for repatriation, uh, the good practice employer should pay for the cost of the worker's return or fare. Um, and, and also this, I think that I, I put wrongly here, the dialogue with workers and workers' representatives. In, in the next slide, so in terms of the guidance um, that you can look at for more details, you can check out this uh, materials that uh, our project and my former project developed with the Malaysian Employers Federation. It's the business responsibility on preventing and addressing forced labor in Malaysia. It's available online. And then in terms of the um, uh, recruitment um, guidelines, um, you can look at the general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment. And that, that's also the definition of recruitment fees and related costs. And for the next slide, I think this is on child labor. Oh, on, so on discrimination uh, in respect of employment and occupation, um, it's important that um, there's, you know, that all uh, workers are treated um, in equally. Um, so no, no worker should be treated differently or less favorably because of their characteristics uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, race, color, uh, sex, religion, political opinion. Um, even you know the age um, or or having HIV and age, um, so this is from the recruitment to the actual employment and even um, the like termination of employment. So the worker should be their their merits or inherent um, their their competencies has to be the basis you know for for their treatment uh, for their like the benefits that that they get from the company, um, and and we move to the next slide. So how to promote uh, non-discrimination um, in, in your company. So having clear policies and procedures that really um, make the qualifications, the skills and experience as the basis for your recruitment, um, placement, uh, training and advancement of staff at all level, uh, levels. And then um, assigning responsibility for equal employment issues at high level, um, issue, issuing this clear uh, company-wide policies uh, to guide equal employment practices. Um, and really being uh, performance based, you know, when when we talk about um, advancing in, in their career, then it has to be linked also with their performance. Um, and then providing staff training on non-discrimination policies and practices, including disability awareness, um, also making some changes in your company um, uh, on how to um, to be to to address the needs, you know, of the, those that are that have disabilities, for instance. And um, working on a case-to-case -case basis to evaluate whether a distinction is an inherent requirement of a job and to avoid applications of job requirements uh, that would systematically disadvantage certain groups. Um, next slide. Yeah, also keeping up to date records and recruitment uh, training and promotion uh, so that you have a transparent basis uh, for opportunities for employees and their progression uh, within the organization. Um, and then um, where you find an issue of discrimination to, you know, to have a good grievance procedure to address these uh, issues, um, handle appeals and provide recourse for employees. Um, 
and being aware if there are formal structures or let's say informal uh, cultural issues that actually prevent employees from raising concerns and grievances uh, and uh, establishing programs to promote access to skills uh, development trainings and to particular occupations and applying this to everyone and so lastly uh, let's talk about child labor um, child labor is work that deprives children of their childhood, their potential, and their dignity, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. So not all work done by children is child labor. I have to clarify that because sometimes um, people are, they, they, there's always this thinking that, oh, um, am I, I, I might be, you know, um, doing child labor for my own child, asking them to do housework. This is not uh, the case. Uh, like a... Uh, Household chores would not be considered child labor or those work that are very um, um, light um, that um, meet also the, the allowable work in the national laws. So here we're talking about child that, um, labor that you know affects the children in terms of their uh, physical, mental development, you know, and then they're, it's affecting their education, access to education as well. Um, and let's move to the next slide. So there's this convention of the ILO, the minimum age convention uh, 138, uh, that sets the minimum age um, for admission to employment. And according to this convention, that it shall not be less than the age of uh, compulsory schooling. Um, in any case, shall not be less than 15 years. But for those um, countries that are underdeveloped, uh, it could be 14 years. In Malaysia, um, the Children and Young Persons Act, uh, the, it sets... Um, the minimum age for employment as 15. So it's actually um, in compliance also with, uh, with C-138. So meaning if this child, uh, 15 to 17 years old or just below 18, um, they are allowed to work, but on um, on only on, on certain, you know, um, working hours that are allowed by, by the national law or the, by Children and Young Persons Act or Saba and Sarawak Labor Ordinances. And there, there are also limitations to the, the the, the working time um, as well some sectors are, are not allowed so here they cannot work in hazardous work so anyone below 18 um, cannot engage in hazardous work then there's also the concept of light work um, light work is defined as you know any work that is not likely to be harmful to the child's health or development um, not uh, prejudice their attendance at school. And um, the minimum age for light work could be set uh, from 13 to 15 years of age. And um, in in Malaysia, actually, it's also 13 years old. So 13 to 15 years old, the children, um, or 13 to 14 years old in Malaysia are allowed to do light work, uh, which are um, how th those that are related to, you know, um, a employment uh, on family enterprises that are not harmful to their health or development and, and attendance in school. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll have to rush now because I, I know I have a few more minutes left. So there's also the concept of the worst forms of child labor. Um, this consists, you know, all forms of slavery, um, including trafficking of children, death bandage, um, forced labor of children. So those children also for use in armed conflict, for example, um, children um, in prostitution uh, for the, you know for production of pornography. Also, those um, the use or procuring offering of children and illegal activities um, like uh, trafficking of drugs or production of drugs, as well as this. D here is the most common because this is the um, um, hazardous, this refers to hazardous work. So work which by its nature um, or the circumstances in which it is carried is likely to harm the health, safety, and morals of the child. And in the next slide, um, we'll um, delve a bit more about on hazardous work. So these are examples of the hazardous work according to the um, recommendation 190 of the ILO. So work that exposes children to physical, psychological, or sexual abuse, uh, work underground, underwater, at dangerous heights, or in confined spaces, um, work with dangerous machinery, equipments, and tools, um, work in unhealthy environment, uh, work under particularly difficult conditions, uh, such as work for long hours uh, or during nighttime, or when where the child is reasonably confined to the premises of the employer. And um, let's see in the next slides, um, what are the 
uh, ways to promote the eradication of forced labor or the effective abolition of forced labor. So there are three H here that the approaches that you can use. First is, you know, to have a policy to end the practice of hiring children. And um, if there are children in, in the businesses, um, let's say you look at the age of the children, um, if it's 15 to 17, so they're allowed to work, but make sure that they're not doing hazardous child labor. If, if let's say if currently they're doing hazardous work, then uh, make sure that you know they 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 are reassigned to tasks that are non-hazardous, um, or also you know um, the the other H is you know reducing the working hours of any children um, above the minimum age to ensure that they this is in compliance with the law. So like, for example, um, there's a different limit to the working hours for the children that are 13 to 14 years old uh, and, and also for 15 to 17 years old, uh, they can work uh, more, more than that. But you have to, to really consider the age of the child and uh, the limits that are set in the, the national laws. And not just the, um, the working time that you have to, to be mindful of, but also you know, um, how they are able to access as well, like for example, um, a education um, that could be provided by, by the company as well. So if we go to the next slide. So um, when we say ending the practice of hiring children, uh, it's it's not a, you know a freeze in hiring, but it's a permanent ban. Um, really making sure that um, a starting immediately there won't be a hiring of, of the children. Um, so that that is a, a good policy, and then having you know making sure that uh, this is implemented by those in charge of hiring process. Um, the important um, thing that you would consider is how do you verify the age of the job applicants? If let's say if there's no proper documentation, so you can um, there are some guidelines as to how to do this. In some cases, the the, the medical practitioners are able to help. Um, or there are other documents that, that could um, sort of you know, like be used as proxy to determine the age of the child. And once the hiring ban is in place, uh, the business can then consider um, what to do with those children that have been hired before the ban. And, and this is what we'll talk in the next slides. So it, it's in terms of those that are already in the company, um, to make sure that you know those children that are allowed to work, so those 15 to 17 years old, um, there's the reduction uh, of uh, the, there's the removal of hazards uh, by improving the workplace safety and health. So having you know assessing, um, making sure that there's proper um, OSH assessments, and then uh, remove adolescents from tasks and environments that are deemed hazardous. And next slide. Um, the reduction of working hours, um, we, we've discussed about this also, but, you know, they must not work more than the weekly maximum as prescribed by law. Um, and this could be also useful in cases where the parents employ their own child. So I, I'd like to also clarify that, you know, sometimes people would say, but this is not child labor because they're working with the parents, not automatically. Because if, let's say, if that work is hazardous, then that could still be considered child labor. Or if that work is, you know, um, in uh, contravention with what is in the, the law, then that could still be considered regardless if they're working with their parents. So here you need to look also at those situations. And if there are workers below the legal age who work part-time, the action would be to reduce their hours so they do not exceed the legal limit. Um, in some cases also, the re reduction of uh, hours may be allowed for children so that um, they can, you know, go to school and do the homework. So um, in, in the, the important consideration here is that, you know, when, when children, the children are helping support the needs of their family. And, and um, what do you do with that? Because then, you know, the, there, there's some responsibility, sense of responsibility there also. So in some instance, the companies uh, would hire the adults in their family to re replace the child um, at work. So they would do the training for the parents or for the, the brother, the older brother. Um, so the child goes to school. And then also some companies provide, you know, like um, educational facilities um, to so the children are, are able to attend school. Uh, they even pay for the teachers. Um, the, there's, there's also, so looking at this holistically, it's not the usual, you know, uh, quick solution. Let's remove children out of child labor and that's it. 
uh, because sometimes that could actually uh, lead them to work in, in other worse situations. So, so what, um, how, how would you replace that income lost, for example, and, and looking at the possibility of uh, providing decent work for the parents? And, and then the um, next slide. Oh, so there's the last, which is the safe and healthy working environment. So we're talking about OSH here. Uh, and this is really covering, you know, um, a lot of the, the full aspects. From, so from anticipating what could be the hazard um, or risks, recognize, recognition, evaluation, and control of these hazards um, that could impair, impair the health and well-being of the workers. And uh, next slide. So what to do or how to promote um, safe and working envir uh, environment. So um, there's the identification of the hazards, um, who could be harmed and how, and then evaluating you know, the risks, um, identifying and deciding on the safety and health risk uh, control measures. And in here, you will find in the ILO website um, a lot of guidance. So maybe in your, you know, in your for your particular sector, you will actually um, see this. There's over 40 guidance there. Um, yeah, and then recording um, the the risk as well as monitoring or reviewing this. Um, but in in all cases, uh, ensuring that workers and the representatives are fully involved in the process. So I think I end here. I'm sorry. I I think. Uh, I ran out a bit of uh, my time. Thank you so much, and, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for that, Judy. That was really very comprehensive. We do have a couple of questions, so and we have five minutes left, so let me just get to it. Um, the first question is, what engagement has been done with the capital markets and human rights organizations in Malaysia? Action appears to be reactive only after there is foreign attention on it. Why is this? Do you want me to answer this or uh, I can, yeah, 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 it can, okay. Um, yeah, so we we uh we work closely with um the government, uh, the workers, and, and the, the employers in Malaysia, also with the uh, civil society, um, uh, in terms of you know raising awareness about um labor uh, rights, um, international labor standards. And there's still a lot of uh, work that needs to be done, um, as you see. You know, like uh, like what you rightly mentioned here, um, it seems that the the actions are reactive. Uh, what we want to see is, of course, that there's more proactive actions. You know, really making sure that there's a lot of preventive measures um, that are in place. So stronger institutions, for instance, stronger um, labor inspection, um, more uh, due diligence that are implemented by companies themselves, um, stronger um, a union um, activities as well in terms of you know um, engaging um, workers uh, in different sectors, um, and 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 then that um, comprehensive um, uh, capacity building and awareness raising so um, this i think um yeah the the there there is this this gap that um we hope could also be addressed by the implementation of the national action plan on forced labor uh mm -hmm. which malaysia uh, has, has already launched yeah. okay great thank you uh remy do you have anything to add to that I think, yeah, just adding from um, sort of the looking across the investment chain, and particularly um, with the PRI, uh, we're about to launch uh, our sort of flagship, uh, the collaborative engagement on human rights and social issues, looking across the renewable um, energy value chain. I think what's important to consider with that um, is that there is a potential later down the track for other sectors uh, to be added. Um, and with these, uh, the focus companies may or may not have operations within Malaysia and um, also with the growing attention uh, coming towards decent work, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's there is growing momentum um, and there is growing awareness of the how powerful uh, stewardship levers are and collaborative action is. Um, and one of the key uh, goals is implementation of the UNGP. So it is sort of, a, you know, watch this space and see how this is developing. Okay, great. Uh, there is one question for Jody. Uh, what should you do if you're a contract manufacturer for a big electronics MNC and you are told double your output in three months? If you don't, we will sack you. Yeah, this is this is a very important question. And you know, uh, in the MNE declaration of the ILO, it states there the responsibility also of um, companies to be. Um, uh, responsible in, in how they deal with their uh, like suppliers, for instance.
instance. And um, it's the same thing, you know, with, with the other um, instruments that are in place to make sure that um, there's there's also the consideration as to the capacity, for instance, of um, those that are in your supply chain, the lower tiers. Um, to 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 give realistic uh let's say you know um deadlines or or um requirements um bearing in mind that this could have an impact as to the um, uh, working conditions of the workers so it's it's really this you know um if if i were this contract manufacturer of course i'll have to i need a dialogue and then uh, share you know the challenges um that we're encountering and how this could potentially impact um the the workers and in the company um and um also be you know um be uh, frank on the support that you would need uh, to actually meet this deadline so it, it could be for example that um you would need to hire more people so that you know you don't um you, you don't sacrifice as well uh, the the labor rights so for you as a as a contract manufacturer never you know like um be responsible and not sacrifice the, the workers rights also uh, just to to um, meet uh, this uh, requirements okay we have one final uh, question so perhaps both uh, remy and jody you can weigh in on this human rights appears to be under the radar in malaysia and our family laws don't seem supportive for female economic empowerment uh, do you have any comments on this yeah so um Sorry, can I, is this, is this in the, I'm trying to, can you repeat it again, Nabina? I did not hear yeah. it. It's uh, human rights appears to be under the radar in Malaysia and our family laws don't seem supportive for female economic empowerment. Any comments? Yeah. Um, I think it's um very, very important to address this also. And, um, you know, the uh, labor reform, um, like uh, reviewing the current policies that um, actually hinder uh, the participation, women participation um, in the labor force. And, and also the, um, those in the national laws, uh, like currently the legislation are mostly gender neutral, if you look at it, you know, and um, including, you know, laws that are uh, governed um, OSH, for instance, or uh, the other rights at work. Um, but how, if you look at it, it could have a differential effect uh, to both women and men uh, workers, especially for the, um, the women workers. So for instance, some of these laws could uh, result to gender-based stereotypes that certain sectors are only for men or, or for, you know, and then it could also result to gender-based um, uh, working conditions, you know, the division of, of, of working conditions and workplace that apply to, to one um, gender. Um, yeah, so, so it, it disadvantage uh, one group of workers and could lead to indirect forms also of uh, discrimination in that sense. So there needs to be a thorough review. And uh, in that sense, that would be good to to have um, consultations with, you know, women's uh, groups um, and understand the challenges that are facing to participate um, actively. Great. Uh, Remy, anything to add? Any final words before we close? Yeah, I think this is a really important question and something that um, is sort of still through sort of the investment world, um, diversity, equity, inclusion is still slowly being integrated. Um, and it's sort of a question about um, from asset owners, how do we ensure that investor managers have their house in order before they address it across their portfolios? Um, and I think one important uh, point to raise is particularly looking through uh, the European Union as uh, stable finance taxonomy, looking at corporate sustainable uh, due diligence is increasingly in, uh, amounts of questions around diversity, equity, inclusion for European companies. Um, to report on across their portfolios. And this is all their sort of global operations. So this is sort of another uh, uh, sort of push factor that will um, hopefully encourage greater action on diversity equity inclusion, particularly around uh, uh, women workers. Um, and this is something that's still under development and we're also seeing um, in the United States as well. So this is something uh, internationally that will have um, sort of impacts across investment portfolios. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This brings us to the end of our session today. I'd like to thank Jody and Remy so much for your input in uh, today's webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, by Friday, you'll, you'll receive an email with the slides from, from today's session. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.
Thanks, Kambina. Thank Bye, Rami. Thanks, everyone. Bye.